How many of you think that sometimes the broken road you're on with all the pits and the mars and the pains prepares you to do God's will? And that's what that last song was talking about. And last week we were talking about spiritual gifts in the church and service. And I said that was act number one. That was part A. Today we're going to act number two and part B in one of the places I referenced last week, 1 Peter 4. 1 Peter 4, verses 7 through 12. I'm sorry, through 11 is where we're going to be in a, in a sermon I've titled Service and Gifts. Now, as we're preparing for this, as you're looking for that, this is what it says. The end of all things is near. Therefore, be clear-minded, or it could be translated sober-minded, and self-controlled so that you can pray. Verse 8, above all, love each other deeply, because love does what? It covers over a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality to one another, but not just offer it, but do it without what? Without grumbling, right? We're going to talk a little bit about that. Each one should use whatever gift he has received to serve others, faithfully administering God's grace in its various forms. In verse 11, if anyone speaks, he should do it as one who's speaking the very words of God. In fact, it's translated in other texts, the oracles of God. If anyone serves, he should do it with the strength God provides, so that in all things, and this is the reason, God may be praised or glorified through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. And I think it's interesting that we're in the middle of this text. Uh, the book of 1 Peter is about suffering, and you can prepare yourselves for it because we're actually going to take a walk through 1 Peter in the near future. We're going to walk through the entire book, all three chapters, verse by verse through that. And we're going to be looking at that, so I'm giving you a little bit of a preview. But as part B to last week, you know, I was thinking about, um, you know, the big movie coming out in May for this summer is The Avengers, the second one. You know, the Battle of Ultron or something like that. I saw some some trailer for it, and it looks just out of this world, you know. And my daughter, Kayla's talking about it, and teens are talking about it, and kids are talking about all that stuff. And I, so I went back, and we owned the first one. I watched it. And there's an interesting character in there, uh, Nick Fury, who's a head of S.H.I.E.L.D. And he has this idea in the first Avengers when they talk about it. You know, the, the council of nations that he reports to, these guys who kind of show up as holograms and he talks to. And they say, well, you know, this group of guys, these, these Avengers, they're a bunch of, bunch of freaks. And, you, you know, you put them all together, they're just going to make things worse. They're not going to help us against this invasion of aliens. And he says, well, I had an idea. And we had an idea that these talented individuals that had these unique gifts, that if we put them together into one unit, blending all the differences, that they could be something greater and more. And he has that whole speech that he gives to them. And when I was th reading that or, or listening to it, actually watching it, I was thinking about this passage in last week. Remember the big thing from last week was the diversity of the spiritual gifts that God gives us but how they blend us into one unified group, that they are designed, that diversity, to bring us into unity, that what I miss, you have, and what I have, you miss, and that we, we minister to one another, that we're the body of Christ, and that we need each other. In fact, we looked at the eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you, and the hand can't say to the foot, I don't need you. We need everything. And remember, I made all you silly people raise your hands and say, I'm a big toe. You guys remember that, and I was one of them, right? We're big toes. Because we all know that without a good big toe, a running back can't run, right? Well, it's, it's a piece of Southern Baptist life. It's a piece of being who we are as people. That we believe that we are better together. And as we look at this in service and gifts and how we serve each other and are gifted for each other, I want you to be thinking about we are better together. As Southern Baptists, there's 45,000 Southern Baptists, the largest Protestant denomination in the world. Second only to Roman Catholicism. And that's great. And these 16,000 Southern Baptist churches come together and we cooperate on missions to send 10,000 missionaries across the globe to give people the gospel of Jesus Christ. So someone in the class was saying, well, why are we Southern Baptists? And I said, because we cooperate well together. And we, we do life well together. And that's what makes us good. And so as we approach this passage... We're going to first see that there's three avenues of service to others in verses 7 through 9. 
three avenues of service to others. Then we move down to 10 and 11. We're going to be looking at the means or the channels of that service, the spiritual gifts. And there's two primary areas of speaking and serving that we're going to look at. But the first thing I want you to see in verse 7 is the reason for us to use spiritual gifts. Verse 7, the end of all things is near. Peter understands. Peter gets it. You know, today we say, hey, that guy just doesn't get it. Peter got it. Way back then, 2,000 years ago, Peter got it. Jesus is exited from us. He's ascended to the right hand of the Father. And he said he's coming, and he said he's coming soon. And he said he's coming now. And Jesus is coming back. And for all of us here today, we need to understand that the reason we need to be busy serving and using our spiritual gifts is because Jesus is coming, and he's coming soon. Now, I can't tell you a date and a time, and if somebody does, don't listen. Because Jesus said, no man knows the date or the hour, but the Father in heaven. He said, I don't even know. But he's coming back, and he's coming soon. And he's bringing his reward with him, and he's going to judge the living and the dead for what we've done. So we need to be busy in service and using our gifts in the church because he's coming. And this is the other thing Peter understood. Think about Peter's life. Now, Peter wrote this. Think about his life. He understood what it was like to be hammered by the enemy. Peter is the one who denied Christ three times. Can you imagine that? He's part of Jesus' inner circle. John, Peter, and James, the inner circle. He was the one that was there. He was at the, the grave when Jesus was risen from the dead, and he went into the grave, and he picked up the cross. He knew what the high points were and the low points. He knew what it was like to deny Christ. He knew what it was like for Satan to go against him. Remember, Jesus said, I'm going to the cross. It's coming. It's going to happen soon. I will depart from you guys. And Peter says in his flesh, Lord, you cannot go, and there's no way we're going to allow that to happen. You'll never go the cross. And what does Jesus say? He turns around and he says, get behind me, Satan. He didn't say, Peter, you're wrong. He says, get behind me, Satan. He knew that Satan was speaking through Peter and trying to keep him from going to the cross to die for your sins and mine, to redeem all of mankind. So Peter knew what it was to fail. He knew what it was for the devil to be a roaring lion that prowls around looking for who he can devour. 1 Peter 5, 8, right? In the same book. He knew that well. He knew what it was like to fail. For Satan to use him. For him to fall short. And so he knew that the end of all things is near. It's getting critical. He preached the gospel at the day of Pentecost and 3,000 people came to Christ. And the church was born and Peter was used by God to do that. But he knew the highs and the lows and he knows that God's coming soon. And so we need to be busy because the devil is busy. All right? He knew what happens when we don't pray, love, and show hospitality. The three avenues we're going to look at. That we eventually, as a church, fall into the pit of hell, so to speak, metaphorically. That we become agents of harm to each other instead of good. So verse 7, verse 7, it says, The end of all things is near. Therefore, for that reason, be what clear-minded and self-controlled so that you can pray. And the big idea of being clear-minded and being self-controlled is for the channel of service that we can do to one another, the first channel, which is prayer. The first channel of service that you should write down that we could do to each other is prayer. Prayer is powerful. Prayer changes things. Prayer changes the world. The world with God in it revolves around the axis of God's people praying and cooperating with God in His will to enact in the world. Therefore, be clear-minded, be sober-minded, be self-controlled. You need to be ready, right? Remember what Jesus said to Peter? Satan's asked me to sift you like wheat, but I have what? I have prayed for you that when you have turned back that you will strengthen your brothers. Jesus gives us the model of being self-controlled and of being clear-minded and of praying. He prayed for Peter that he would not fall when Satan was going after him. And Peter becomes powerful. He becomes the, the catalyst for the early church. I've prayed for you, Peter, that when you turn back, you'll be strengthened, and you'll strengthen the brothers. Jesus knew the value of prayer, right? And he knew what it was to be clear-minded and self-controlled. He went to the Garden of Gethsemane, and he prayed in John chapter 17 for you and for I, that those who would follow after the apostles, the believers, the disciples, down through the centuries, you and I, the followers of Jesus Christ, that we would be unified as one to do the will of the Father. 
So that first channel of service that we do to each other in verse 7 is prayer. It's powerful. Ian Bounds, a great Civil War chaplain, said this, that we spend a lot of time talking to God, I mean to men about God, but we spend very little time talking to God about men. And he went on to explain that in his book, The Power of Prayer, that, that basically the essence is we spend a lot of time talking to, to men about discipleship and reading their Bibles and being men of prayer and loving their wives and this, that, and the other, and all the stuff. And really what we ought to be doing, if we want to change them, is we should be on our knees praying for those men. So yesterday morning when the men's prayer group was together, 16 guys gathered together, men and young men, it's a powerful thing. Every time I participate in that each month, I come home and I tell Kim, I feel a little lifted, a little rejuvenated as we're praying for things. And I know many of you pray in the privacy of your homes. Prayer, I told them, is the railroad tracks of the engine of faith and works. Nothing happens and moves ahead in God's kingdom in His way unless we pray. If we don't prepare the way with the tracks of prayer, then the engine can't move ahead. You ever seen an engine at the end of the tracks? This big, mighty, powerful thing is dead weight and going nowhere. But you've got to prepare the way with tracks. That's what prayer is. That channel of service, when you pray for each other, it is powerful. When we get to the other side of heaven and God reveals everything that was unseen and unknown in the spiritual realm and we see it, I think we will be broken for how much other people impacted our individual lives and our families' lives for how they prayed for us. People that we knew and people that we didn't know. People that we loved and people that never even knew about us but prayed for us anyhow. For how much Jesus prays for us. For, us, for Hebrews 4 says that Jesus is at the right hand of the Father and He intercedes on our behalf. He prays for us. Hebrews 4, 14-16. Therefore, verse 16, we can go boldly before the throne of grace to receive help in our time of need. Jesus prays the Father at His right hand. You and I need to do the same for each other. And it says why? We boldly go to the throne of what? Of grace. See, all the things that we do for service, everything that we do is God's grace. He empowers us. He enables us. It's grace upon grace. You want to impact other people's lives? You do that through prayer, through grace. You open up God's grace. That's why we practice it. That's why we do it. And I think it's interesting. He says, be self-controlled. Be clear-minded. Maybe there's a, a relationship between being self-controlled and clear-minded and a Christian or a person that lives their lives on their knees. You ever think about that? You ever seen a drunk pray? You ever seen a drunk pray? I have. It's not a pretty sight. God still hears them because they're opening their hearts for real. But it's not very clear. And they don't know what they're doing. And they don't remember it. And we do the same thing when we allow other things to control our thoughts and to consume us. Entertainment, the worries and cares of this world. But instead, when we focus ourselves, our thoughts and our minds, on praying for each other, picking up a phone and asking someone else in the church, what's going on in your life? How can I pray for you? Is the first channel of service. Second of all, it says love, verse 8, right? Above all. So which gets, what gets the primacy of these three things? Love. Above everything else. That's right. Above all. Love each other. Right? Isn't this a great command? Love is what the Christian life is all about. So love is the second avenue or the second channel of service to each other in the church. The first is prayer. The second is love. And love is practical. Jesus said, by this will all men know that you are my disciples if you what? If you love one another. How do other people know that you love each other? How do they know? They see what you do. They don't hear the words of your mouth. They care less what your beliefs are. They do care about what you do, which really shows what your beliefs in your heart are. Not your words, but what you do. And so when you love each other, and I've said this church is great about loving each other. That is the power of Calvary Baptist Church, is that we love each other well, very well. You know, I'm downtown. I saw Mr. Donathan down at the key shop, and I run into Kathy down at the prison. And Well, she wasn't in prison, but we were both there. That sounded kind of bad, right? I ran into Kathy in prison. She's behind bars, man. 
It's like seeing my son pass counterfeit money a few weeks ago, you know? Okay? But, you know, we're out in the community. We see each other, and we're doing life on life. And in those contexts, we stop and give each other an encouraging word, and we love each other. You're down at Walmart, and you run into somebody here, and you, you say, how is your day? What's going on with you? And they're real with you, and they say, hey, I'm having a tough day. How can I pray for you? What can I do for you? I mean, that's the power of love. It covers over a multitude of wrongs, right? This is what the Word says. Love is patient. 1 Corinthians 13, many of you memorize this. Love is kind. It's read at weddings. It does not envy. It is not proud. It does not boast. It doesn't puff itself up and say it's the thing. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It's not selfish. Love is not selfish. If you want to know if your behavior is good as a husband or wife, ask yourself, is it selfish? Because if it's selfish, you're not loving your spouse. Okay? Same way as a parent with your kids. It's not self-seeking. It's not easily angered. It keeps no record of what? Wrongs. It lets the bygones be bygones, right? It doesn't bring in everything with a kitchen sink. Love always protects. It always hopes. It always trusts. It always perseveres. And ultimately, verse 8 of 1 Corinthians 13, love never fails. It never fails. In the book of James, it says love. Right? In all these different scriptures, it says love. Jesus spends tons of time talking about love. Above everything else, love. And it says to do it earnestly, right? To do it faithfully, not half-heartedly, right? It says, love each other deeply. In the Greek, it literally means earnestly, with intensity, with forethought, with a desire to be there for each other, deeply. Love each other deeply, right? Because love covers over a multitude of wrongs. Love is ultimately in the Christian life, and in this life, the coup de gras, right? It's pretty good. When I make a mistake, I can make up for it with love. When I fail, I can make up for it with love. When I'm wrong, I can make up for it with love. How do we beat evil? We love. Love is to evil like oxygen is to a fire. You take it away, right? You take oxygen out of a fire, it's dead. You take evil away, and love is in its presence. When love is there, there cannot be evil. They're diametrically opposed. Evil is the absence of good. And when love is present, there is good. It's like sucking the oxygen out of a fire when we add love to a relationship. And so the first channel is to pray for each other. The second channel is to love each other. That looks very pragmatic. We're doing the secret sisters right now, right? The women's ministry is. I love that. I like to come in here and just see what people... Set down, and I've, I've sat out there and looked at those little boxes and those little bags, and I thought, I wonder what's in there. You know, I mean, is it okay? It'd be a little bit like a kid. I wonder what's in there. One gal gave something cool to another. And it's, okay, forgive me, guys, okay? I kind of got into what my wife's doing for hers, you know? She's like, look what I got her. And I said, that's so cool. That is so neat. Just little things of encouragement, little things that you like, little pieces of love. It's so powerful how far that goes. You know, one gal that I, that I counseled professionally in private practice, broken, broken young woman, one well, of the worst I'd ever seen, beautiful physically, huge past of sexual abuse, just, just horrible stuff, things that you can't even speak of in, in company. And, and I remember in like the sixth session that we were together, we were talking about something, and I was talking about her parents, and we were digging into some things, and, and I kind of pressed into an area with some questions that I had, waiting for a response, and her eyes lifted for the first time in six sessions out of her lap, lifted. And they kind of brightened up. And she said, yes, I do remember when I was loved. My mom said this at this place at this time when I was nine years old, and she remembered the date. The date. The date. She was in her 30s. And she could remember the one instance that she could remember of being loved by one person in her life. And it changed her entire countenance. It lifted her everything just remembering it and talking about that one thing. That's how powerful love is. So when we scatter love among each other as the body of Christ, as a channel of service, it lifts each other up. Doesn't everybody want to be encouraged? Doesn't everybody want to be cared for? 
and it covers over a multitude of wrongs. The third channel of service, verse 9, right? Offer hospitality to who? One another. You know, this thing is peppered with the one another's. Do this, pray for one another, love one another, offer hospitality to one another. The reason this is important because it's in the early church, there was no Motel 6. You know, there was nobody leaving the light on for you, man. Okay, nobody had much for light as it was. And there was no way to check in for $56 a night. There was no comfort in, there was no quality in, there was no Holiday Inn Express. So when you traveled among the Roman world, and you were going large distances, and you were a persecuted group by the government, Caesar's government, and if you came out and said, I'm a Christian, it was pretty much your deathbed, then guess what? You were absolutely reliant that when you entered into a town, maybe hundreds of miles away from where you lived, that you found what? A fellow believer that offered you hospitality. A fellow believer that offered you hospitality. Offer one another hospitality. You know, one preacher one time told me about, he's a much older man in his 90s, and he was preaching a revival in Kentucky, and he was going down to a tiny little church up in the Appalachians, and, and he said as he arrived, he was staying with a family, and he showed up. And the man said, here's your accommodations, and he looks, and it's one room house. One room. No outhouse. I mean, there's an outhouse, but no bathroom inside, no, no walls, no nothing. One room. One big bed. Him, this woman, the wife, and the man who's having him there. And the guy says, that far side's your side. Well, my buddy started, started thinking in his head, what, what does that mean? Well, what it meant was, you're sleeping on that side, me and my wife are sleeping on this side. We're all sharing the same bed. So the guy said, you know, we'll turn our backs this way while you get dressed. And then when you're done, you step outside while we get dressed, and we'll let you hop in first, and then we'll hop in. What's interesting about that is by today's standards, that seems just archaic. But my friend in his 90s talks about how that was one of the most impactful times ever somebody's offered him hospitality. These people were as poor as you could possibly get by, US standard, by world standards, but by U.S. standards for certain. And yet they offered everything that they had. They fed him. They offered him a comfortable bed, the warmth of sharing that with each other. They were good, gracious, and decent about it. And to this day, in his 90s, he remembers that, that heart of goodness and hospitality. We need to practice it, and this, this church is great. Love each other deeply, but practice, offer hospitality to one another. Meet each other's needs in practical ways. You know, it used to be a norm in our culture. But is it true today? Now, I will say this, on the western slope, you guys have the front range beat on hospitality by a thousand percent. You just do. I mean, that's in the city, cities have people come in and people leave. And you, you get used to making relationships and losing relationships just like that. And especially in a military town like Carl Springs, people come and go every month. My church that I was a part of would change. Its population of a thousand people would change all the time. And so you made quick friends and you said goodbye with love quickly too. It's nicer to have established long-term relationships like here. And you guys know how to offer hospitality. But I remember people saying to me, I'd say, do you know your neighbors? Living in a prominent neighborhood in Colorado Springs, do you know your neighbors? How long have they lived here? Well, they've lived next door three or four years. Can you tell me their names? I think her name's Carol. I think his name's John. Do you know anything about him? Nope. In the morning, they open up their garage, jump in their car, pull out, go to work, come home later. Park, pull in, shut it, they're in their house. We don't see each other on the weekends, we're both gone. We all do our thing and don't know each other. How can you ever minister and love on each other when it's like that, right? You gotta invite people into your home. You gotta minister to them, you gotta love them. You know, my dad talked about a time back in the day when he was in South Dakota in the Depression era, that during those times nobody locked their doors in case somebody needed to come in and sleep on your floor. And they would put whatever was left over from dinner out on the front covered porch. It was screened in so the bugs wouldn't get it. Whatever meat, bread, veggies, fruit that they had left over, they put out there with a lantern and left it on because so many people were poor that as they traveled, that was all they were going to have to eat. And if they didn't have something to eat that you offered, then they weren't going to eat at all. And so people did that. And I said, didn't you ever, you know, my, my question to him, didn't you ever worry about them breaking in, doing something harm to you? No. Everybody's in the same boat. We are all hurting. 
People are worried about having something in their stomach, not about robbing you. So hospitality used to be normal, and you guys practice it well, but we can always look for ways to serve each other better. This is what one commentator says. The key to hospitality is to just begin it. It doesn't matter if you live in an apartment, a house, a dorm, or a farm. Open your homes each week. Bake cookies. Say hello to a stranger in the elevator. Check up on an old neighbor. Hospitality is something that is overly pragmatic. It's not something that we do to get conversations going or, or just to get conversions to build the church. We practice hospitality because what? It is right. It is the right thing to do to each other. We practice hospitality because it's right. We practice hospitality because we are God's people. We share God's goodness through our lives and our home because God has shared His goodness with us. We are hospitable because God was first hospitable to who? To us. We practice the same practice of our Lord. His grace overthrows the thresholds of our lives and our homes and should be spilling out into the world and filling it with the grace of God. Oh, I love that. That is great stuff. Hospitality. And do it with what? Remember, don't do it with grumbling, right? Don't do it with grumbling. Right? I mean, how many of you ever had a pesky person come over for, for dinner or something like that, right? They go to the restroom and go through your medicine cabinet. Like you don't know. You're rifling through my meds. Come on. I know you were going through my drawers. Come on. Right? But you still have to invite them back. Maybe their kids got into your closet, you know, those pesky kids. By the way, train your kids not to do that. Because people want to invite you back, right? And your grandkids too. Don't do that. But even with those pesky, weird Weird ones that we sometimes have, we still got to love them. They're part of the church of God. So you have prayer, you have love, you have hospitality as the avenues or the channels of service. Now let's move to spiritual gifts. Verse 10. Each one should use whatever gift he has received to serve others, faithfully administering God's grace in its various forms. So the first kind of spiritual gifts, and we looked at some of those last week, was the gifts of service. The gifts of service, as opposed to the next one, if someone speaks, he should do it as the very words of God, the gifts of speaking. Two big categories of gifts, right? But what does it say in verse 10? The channels of this service, these spiritual gifts, the necessary exercise of them that bless other people is for who? Is it for you and for me? Who's it for? It says for each one. Verse 10, first two verses, two words, each one. So who's left out in that? Who's left out? Nobody. We're all in the boat together. Each of us should use whatever gift he has received. So the sixth thing you, second thing you need to look at that is, is if it's received, if it's a gift, what did you do for it? Nothing. Yes, nothing. If it's a spiritual gift, you can't be boastful about it. Remember, we looked at the first Corinthians, they were boastful about the gift of tongues. And gift of prophecy being better than just being a servant. Well, guess what? No, you can't. It's a gift from God. If it's a gift from God, you can't boast about it. Somebody gave it to you. You did nothing for it. Right? And it says, each one of us choose whatever gift. Does that mean that we have different gifts? Yes, it does. We have different gifts. Each one should use whatever gift he's been given. Right? Faithfully. Administering God's grace in its various forms. That's what the spiritual gifts are. They're grace upon grace. Basically, you guys are pipes. Pipes. When we were down in Ecuador, we were working on a project in, in Otavala, or maybe it was Riobamba, I don't remember, one of those mountain villages, and, and uh, we were building a swing set, and they had these pipes that we could build the main frame from, these old pipes. You got out, I mean, there's no power tools because there's no power. So you're out hacksawing this thing and cutting into it. You're trying to screw these things together and all this stuff. And, and one of the things I noticed was these pipes, some of these pipes were very heavy as I picked them up from this, this uh, kind of like place where we had all this pipe setting up. And I was like, why is this pipe so heavy compared to the other pipe? Well, I picked up one pipe and I looked in it and it was clear and you could see the sunlight through it and it was clean and everything. And I picked up the, another one that was real heavy and it was filled with muck. I think they just ripped it out of some building. It's probably like a sewage pipe or something, you know? Just filled with stuff we won't even discuss. Muck. Junk. 
And see, that's what our lives are like. We are pipes for the Holy Spirit. When we administer the power of the spiritual gifts, it's like water flowing through a clear pipe. The first pipe, you can see daylight. Water flows right through it. It's great. The second pipe's filled with muck. Nothing flows through it. So what do we do with those? We wrote a rooter of those, right? We call out a guy and, and run the big blades through there. Get it all clean. We have to do the same thing with our lives. Ephesians 5.18 says, Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Galatians 5 says, Keep in step with the Spirit. Wherever He's going, whatever He's doing, keep up with Him. But to do that, we have to practice the dailies. Being in the Word, being in prayer, praising God, confessing our sins each day, keeping short accounts, so that we as a pipe, as a conduit of God's power, for His power to flow through us, is clean. We're not a mucked up pipe. We're a clean pipe and the water can flow through. God's power can flow through us, right? Grace, administering God's grace in its various forms. Growth in our grace. As we grow in Christ, as we're more submitted to the power of God, don't you think our spiritual gifts become more powerful? You know, some people say, Greg, I don't know what my spiritual gift is. And I said last week, get involved. The best way to find out is not an inventory, even though I'm not against inventories. But it is to get involved. Because that's how God naturally uses it. And as you try this and try this and try that and try that, the Holy Spirit shows through other people in you that, hey, that's my gift. And other people in the church respond and say, that's where I'm good at. And you know what else you feel? You feel like, this is where I belong. When you're doing what God's designed you to do, you have that sense of fulfillment. Not always perfection, not always glory, not always something great, but you have that sense of fulfillment in the body of Christ that I'm good at this because God's made me, the, God's made me for this. God's made me for this. When Hunter is leading right here, he's kind of caught up. You ever watch his face? He looks like a clown. Love you, man. But what I mean by that is he is joyous. A clown's got the big smile on his face. He's happy. Kids love clowns. Hunter's joyous when he's, when he's caught up praising God. That's how God's gifted him. That's how God's using him to serve the church. When we're doing what God's designed us to do, we are exactly where we're supposed to be, and we're happy. We know it. Now, the opposite of that is when we're serving people, we're happy, we know it, we know when we fit. But the opposite is when we're not serving, using our spiritual gifts, and other people are just serving us. Do we know what we are supposed to be doing? Do we know what our spiritual gifts are? No. How many of you have ever taken a cruise? How many of you have taken a cruise? They're pretty sweet, aren't they? Okay, I used to have this principal I worked for. I could tell when he was getting ready to go on a cruise because he'd start eating yogurt only for breakfast and lunch for like two months. I'd say, why are you eating yogurt? And he'd say, man, I'm going to gain 15 pounds on that cruise in the first three days. And I said, Why? I said, Jim, his name is Jim Welty at Aragon Elementary. I said, why? And he said, dude, when my wife goes to sleep at 3 a.m., I go out, and the guy makes me a T-bone steak, and he makes me a lobster and some crab legs and everything my doctor says no, my wife says no to, I'm at peace with the chef, man. It's just me and him. And I said, you like that service, don't you? He goes, oh, man, he serves me up. It's just one-on-one. -on -one. I just eat all I want. And I said, yeah, that's why you gained 15 pounds in three days, man. He goes, yeah, but it's worth every single moment. It's worth every single moment, right? But on a cruise ship, other people serve you. Does, do you do any service on a cruise ship? No, people serve you around the clock. So you would never know if you were good at doing work on a ship or not because you don't ever get to try it. We have Christians that come to church and do the same thing. They're cruise ship Christians. They come in, they sit. You know, my grandfather, an old preacher, used to call them pew warmers. I said, why do you call them pew warmers? He goes, that's all they're good for. Forgive me. Forgive me. But he's saying basically they come and they warm a pew. That's all they do. They do nothing for the Lord. They do no ministry. They do no growth. And they're going nowhere in their Christian life. And they do not build up the church. They just warm the pew. Okay? He's, he, you used to call them bro cream Christians. A little dab will do you. I'll take a little bit of Jesus and don't give me any more. Okay? I'll take a little bit of church, but don't ask me to do anything. Cruise ship Christians, man, people serve them. They don't serve in the body. But that's not how it works. God says to be ministers, it says faithfully administering. In the second part of verse 10, God's grace. That means literally to minister, which means to serve. Minister can literally be translated as servant, 
I am your servant as your minister. Does that feel good? You got yourself your own little servant. Okay? But what that means is to serve you in the Lord in spiritual things. Faithfully administering whatever gift that we've received to serve other people. That's what we're supposed to be. We're not supposed to be cruise ship Christians. We're supposed to be involved. You know, Dr. Orge from Golden Gate, one of my uh, professors, he's the president of Golden Gate Baptist Theological Seminary, took a class on ministry leadership with him. Awesome and brutal. So the very first class, we sit down. He sits down in a T-shirt and a pair of shorts and some sandals, puts his feet up on the desk, and he says, Gentlemen, all of you cannot be here. And I said, What do you mean? He said, All of you are expendable. By this time in six years, 75% of you will be out of the ministry. You'll be doing something else. That's the statistic. Only 25% of you will last six years in ministry. And many of you will fall in ministry. You'll make foolish mistakes that cost you being a minister. Sins in your life. And for those who do survive, you are a temp. And I said, what do you mean by that? He says, you're only a temporary filling. God's plugged you into the place that you're serving for a while. And then he removes you, if nothing else but by death at the end of your life. And then somebody else takes that space. You have only a short while, was his next statement, to make an impact. So you better be working hard. You better be doing it for the Lord. Because you only have a little while. Well, that kind of set the tone for the whole semester for 16 weeks. That he told us the truth, which is, you got to be doing it right. you got to be living for the Lord, on your knees, for your congregation, ministering to people, because it's a short while. And he would come in and he would draw on on the whiteboard, he'd put a little dot a little black marker right in the middle. And he'd say, that's your life. It's a speck in time. And then he'd draw a little big line out here with an arrow, a vector, which means it goes on forever. And he says, this is your life in heaven and eternity. Everything that you do in this speck right now is all your rewards forever. What are you doing? And then you get up and walk out. Lesson over. <laughs> you got it real quick. The channels of service, of prayer, of love, of hospitality, using our spiritual gifts as that avenue, serving each other in those ways. The service gifts are powerful. They're powerful. People who change the lights and sew the chairs and vacuum the floors are just as important or more important than the people that speak about the Bible. Teaching people like me. They're just as important or more so. They're just as important to God in using their gifts. Faithfully administering the gifts, the grace of God to other people. So you see, Ephesians 2.10 says this, God has prepared for us in advance to do good works that what? We should walk in them. Before the foundations of the world, God knew that you were going to come to him and that you were going to make a decision for him. And he prepared in advance the good things, the ways that you were going to be made and tooled up and ready to work for good works that you were supposed to do. And if you don't do them, You missed out on God's will. If you don't serve each other with your spiritual gifts, loving each other, praying for each other, offering hospitality, using those services, you've missed out on God's will. But it's not God's fault. He prepared you for that. He prepared for us in advance to walk in those good ways. We need to use them. We need to be faithful, right? And it's a responsibility. Verse 10, faithfully administering God's grace. Faithfully administering. It's a responsibility. Stay at the wheel. Everybody likes a ship captain that stays at the wheel. When that ship hit that island in the Mediterranean and capsized, and it took two years for them to get that ship out of the water and get it off, and all those people died, when they investigated, they found that that ship captain who had 20-something years of experience was out messing around with some gal. He was not faithfully at the wheel doing his job. That's what we need to be, is faithfully at the wheel of ministry. And some people say, well, I've done it for years, and I've done this, and I've done that. When do you get to quit? When do you get to quit? When you're dead. When God gives you a one-way chick at home, then you get to rest in glory. But while we're here, we need to be faithfully administering God's grace in its various forms. And I'll tell you something. That's just not an opinion. In the Greek, that is in the Aorist tense, which means that it's an ongoing, continuous 
process. Faithfully administering what God's given you. Doing it, right? When do we stop? When God takes us home. When we're pushing up daisies, right? Then when we're in heaven, we get to be a cruise ship Christian. We get to sit back and take it easy, right? God will determine. You know, people will say to me, well, I don't know where to plug in or how to do it or this, that, and the other. Just get going. Get moving. People will move you and plug you in. And guess what? The body of Christ has a way of finding you into the right niche and plugging and playing in the right place. You will fit in the puzzle of God's peace at Calvary Baptist. No matter who you are, no matter what you do, you will fit. You just got to be doing it. And the thing is, when other believers say, hey, maybe you should try this. Hey, you know, um, maybe you're not so good at this. But over here, I think you'd be good at that. Don't take that as a rebuke. Take that as encouragement to plug into the right place. The Spirit of God working through the people of God move us into the right avenues where we plug in and fit to serve the body of God. I told you Cliff said many years ago to me, my minister of education, Greg, I think you know, you're know you kind of strong on that speaking stuff. You kind of give it out there to people, man. You might have the gift of preaching. We might need to shape that. And I told him, you've lost your mind. I will never be a minister, and that is not what I'm going to be doing, and that's not what God's called me to do. Well, I owe Cliff an apology, don't I? Right? Cliff could see it. He had the gift of discernment. He could see where it was going, and he knew that, and God gave him that bill. I should have listened. And when you start serving and doing those things, God says it's more blessed to give than to receive, Jesus says in the book of Acts. When you start doing those things, those avenues of service through your spiritual gifts for each other and loving on each other and praying for each other and offering hospitality and serving each other and, and speaking the word of God and truth and love to each other and all those things, and we're doing all that, you f suddenly find out this feels good. It is more blessed to give than to receive. It's boomerang theology. You guys ever throw a boomerang? Oh, they're great. If you know what you're doing. If you know what you're doing, it's chuck. You know, you watch the little kids, they grab that thing and they just whip that thing out. And they just stand around, where's it at, where's it at? Bam! Hits them from behind because they don't know what's going on, right? It's more blessed to give than to receive. But when you give out spiritually in these avenues, it comes back to you. I'm not talking about prosperity theology. I'm not talking about that at all. I'm not talking about God's going to make you wealthy or healthy or wise or any of that. I'm talking about when you give the way God's designed you and you work the way you're supposed to be, you are blessed. It's an intangible thing. And you are fulfilled. Do you know how many people are walking through this life saying life is not fulfilling? When you plug and play where God wants you to be, it's fulfilling. You're doing what you're supposed to be doing. It is more blessed to give than to receive. And what does it say? If anyone serves, he should do it with the strength that God provides. So that in all things, and the reason why we do all this is what? That God may be praised. The end of verse 11. God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To Him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. Peter, in writing this, whipping this out on a piece of parchment, talking about moving from suffering to service to, to the spiritual gifts. And he says, and it's all for the glory of God, for his praise and honor. And he stops in mid-right and he suddenly breaks into a doxology. And he says, to God be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. That tells us something in the way this is structured in the text. That this was important. That when we are plugging and playing and doing what God wants us to do, faithfully administering God's grace that He's given us through us to each other, God is glorified. Isn't that what Jesus said? By this will all men know that you're my disciples, that you love one another. John chapter 15, verse 8, where he talks about that if you're my disciples, you will bear much fruit. And that when you bear much fruit, it's to my Father's glory. 
That's why God wants you to use your spiritual gift. That's why he wants you to serve each other. That's why he wants us to be a great church ministering to each other and loving on each other because he gets the glory. When broken people like you and I look real good with the power of the Holy Spirit working through us, it glorifies him because we couldn't do it on our own. But him flowing through us, that clean pipe, it happens. The mutuality of service in verse 10, serve one another, one to the other. Now, how do we do these things? We talked about being faithful, being at the wheel. But the thing that you should know about that is that idea of faithfulness is about being a manager. It's about being a steward. It's about being in charge of what? Someone else's stuff. So God the Holy Spirit comes to dwell within us, 1 Corinthians 6. He gives us one or more spiritual gifts because everybody gets it at the moment of conversion. You start plugging and playing and using your gifts to God's glory. And when you start doing that, when you start doing that, then you become a faithful minister. You become a faithful manager, right? You are working with the master's goods. You remember the story of Joseph? Joseph and Potiphar's house. Joseph was such a good manager or steward of Potiphar's stuff that he rose to the highest rank in his, in his house. Then when he was before Pharaoh, he was such a good steward and manager of the, of the goods and the food and everything that for the coming famine that he rose to being second only to Pharaoh. But was that stuff Joseph's? Whose was it? It was Pharaoh's. It was Potiphar's. This stuff, it may be moving through us. It may be flowing through us, but it's still God's. We're just managers, just stewards. And what are we stewards of? Our time, our talents, our treasures, opportunities. And then God's grace upon grace that he's given us, that we steward that to other people. 1 Corinthians 4 says, It is required of a steward for a man to be found faithful. Stick with it. And at the end of time, what's God going to say to us if we do a good job? Well done, my good and faithful servant, right? You've been trusted with this stuff. Now I'm going to entrust you with all this. Of which Scripture says, No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love Him. Speaking gifts, teaching, preaching, right? Serving gifts, helps, mercy, giving, governing. Whatever your spiritual gift is, you need to plug and to play. You need to discover it in the body of Christ. So that the end game is that God is glorified, that He is praised. So an application for closing, as we look at this, what should we do? Last week I said, talk to your spouse, talk to your family, talk to friends. The last time you did ministry and you did a great job and people said something about it, think about what you did. I said, start plugging in and serving and let the body of Christ talk to you and let God talk to you and find out your right place to be. I gave you all those as practical things. And I had some different people give me good feedback on that. First, this is our application for today. First, recognize that it's God's grace. If it's God's grace through His Spirit flowing through Him, you need to talk to God about the grace that He's given you for your spiritual gifts and your service. Talk to Him about it. Ask Him to reveal it to you. Second of all, God's grace is determined by His choice. So whatever spiritual gift He's given you, be content. Be content. He's designed you that way for a reason. And I said, Calvary Baptist Church has every single thing that it needs here right now. Right now, today. Well, if everybody was here. The whole church. But it has everything that it needs. And you just have to find out what God's grace is and then be content in it and appreciate the differences. I cannot work with my hands the way that Pete can. Okay? Or the way that Preston can. I appreciate them immensely, the things that they can do. Appreciate the differences, right? And then think about God's strength is needed at all times. It says, if you do it, do it with the strength that God provides. You need to pray for God's strength to be used for Him. Rely upon Him only. And then finally, make sure you keep always before you the goal of your service and gifts, which is for His glory. When you and I take the glory, we're thieves, we're thieves. Don't steal it. Would you walk into somebody else's house and steal their TV? If you do, you're going to jail, right? It's not good. Or you get shot. It's not good. Okay? Well, 
If you walk into somebody's house and steal his big screen TV and he may shoot you or we may put you in jail for 10 years, if that's the consequence of that, what happens when you steal the glory from God? It is a fearful thing to fall in the hands of the Almighty God in a bad way. Give the glory to who it belongs, to Jesus Christ. Okay?